I have spent the past 38 years trying to be invisible. I'm a copy editor. I work at the New Yorker, and copy editing for the New Yorker is like playing shortstop for a major league baseball team. Every little movement gets picked over by the critics. God forbid you should commit an error. Just to clarify, copy editors don't choose what goes into the magazine. We work at the level of the sentence, maybe the paragraph, the words, the punctuation. Our business is in the details. We put the diaresis, the double dot, over the I in naive. We impose house style. Every publication has a house style. The New Yorker's is particularly distinctive. We sometimes get teased for our style. Imagine we still spell teenager with a hyphen, as if that word had just been coined. But you see that hyphen in teenage, and that diaresis over cooperate, and you know you're reading the New Yorker. Copy editing at the New Yorker is a mechanical process. There is a related role called query proofreading or page okaying. Whereas copy editing is mechanical, query proofreading is interpretive. We make suggestions to the author through the editor to improve the emphasis of a sentence, or point out unintentional repetitions and supply compelling alternatives. Our purpose is to make the author look good. Note that we give our proofs not directly to the author but to the editor. This often creates a good cop. Bad cop dynamic, in which the copy editor—I'll use that as an umbrella term—is invariably the bad cop. If we do our job well, we're invisible. But as soon as we make a mistake, we copy editors become glaringly visible. Here is the most recent mistake that was laid at my door. Last Tuesday, Sarah Palin, the pre-Trump embodiment of populist. No nothingism, and the Republican Party endorsed Trump. Where were the New Yorker's fabled copy editors? A reader wrote. Didn't the writer mean no nothingism? Ouch! There is no excuse for this mistake, but I like it. No nothingism might be American vernacular for nihilism. <laughs> <clears throat> Here, another reader quotes a passage from the magazine. Ruby was 76, but she retained her authoritative bearing. Only her unsteady gait belied her age. He added, "Surely someone at the New Yorker knows the meaning of belied, and that it is the opposite of how it is used in this sentence. Come on, get it together. Belie, to give a false impression. It should have been betrayed." E.B. White once wrote of commas in the New Yorker, "They fall with the precision of knives, outlining a body." <laughs> And it's true. We get a lot of complaints about commas. Are there really two commas in Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard? There may not be on the sign, but yes, that is New Yorker style for Jr. One wag wrote, "Please, could you expel or at least restrain the comma maniac?" On your editorial staff. Ah, <laughs>、oh, well. In these cases, those commas are well placed, except that there should not be one between maniac and on. <laughs> also, if we must have commas around at least, we might change it up by using dashes around that phrase, or at least restrain. Perfect. <laughs> Then there's this. Love you, love your magazine, but can you please stop writing massive numbers as text? No. <laughs> One last creed occur from a spelling stickler: those long, stringy things are vocal cords, not chords. The outraged creeder added, "I'm sure I'm not the first to write regarding this egregious proofreading error, but I'm equally sure I won't be the last." Why? Ooh, I used to like getting mail. <laughs> There is a pact between writers and editors. The editor never sells out the writer, never goes public about bad jokes that had to be cut or stories that went on too long. A great 
editor saves the writer from her excesses. Copy editors, too, have a code. We don't advertise our oversights. I feel disloyal divulging them here, so let's have a look at what we do right. Somehow, I have gotten a reputation for sternness, but I work with writers who know how to have their way with me. I've known Ian Fraser, or Sandy, since the early 80s, and he's one of my favorites, even though he sometimes writes a sentence that gives the copy editor pause. Here is one from a story about Staten Island after Hurricane Sandy, a dock that had broken in the middle and lost its other half, sloped down toward the water, its support pipes and wires leaning forward, like when you open a box of linguine and it slides out. <laughs> This would never have got past the grammarian in the days of yore. But what could I do? Technically, the like should be an as, but it sounds ridiculous, as if the author were about to embark on an extended Homeric simile. As when you open a box of linguine, I decided that the hurricane conferred poetic justice on Sandy and let the sentence stand. Generally, if I think something is wrong, I query it three times. I told Sandy that not long ago in a moment of indiscretion, and he said, only three? So he has learned to hold out. Recently, he wrote a story for Talk of the Town. That's the section at the front of the magazine with short pieces on subjects ranging from Ricky Jay's exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum to the introduction of doggy bags in France. Sandy's story was about the return to the Bronx of Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. There were three things in it that I had to challenge. First, a grammar query. The justice was wearing black, and Sandy wrote, her face and hands stood out like in an old, mostly dark painting. Now, unlike with the hurricane, with this like, the author didn't have the excuse of describing hurricane damage. Like, in this sense, is a preposition, and a preposition takes an object, which is a noun. This like had to be an as, as in an old, mostly dark painting. Second, a spelling issue. The author was quoting someone who was assisting the justice. It will be just a minute. We are getting the justice meist. <laughs> meist? The music industry spells it M-I-C because that's how it's spelled on the equipment. I'd never seen it used as a verb with this spelling, and I was distraught to think that meist would get into the magazine on my watch. <laughs> New Yorker style for microphone and in its abbreviated form is mic. Finally, there was a sticky grammar and usage issue in which the pronoun has to have the same grammatical number as its antecedent. Everyone in the vicinity held their breath. There is plural, and everyone, its antecedent is singular. You would never say, everyone were there. Everyone was there. Everyone is here. But people say things like, everyone held their breath all the time. To give it legitimacy, copy editors call it the singular there, as if calling it singular makes it no longer plural. <laughs> it is my job, when I see it in print, to do my best to eliminate it. I couldn't make it everyone held her breath, or everyone held his breath, or everyone held his or her breath. Whatever I suggested had to blend in. I asked through the editor if the author would consider changing it to all in the vicinity held their breath, because all is plural. Nope. I tried again. All those present held their breath? I thought this sounded vaguely judicial. But the editor pointed out that we could not have present and presence in the same sentence. When the final proof came back, the author had accepted as for like and miked for meist. But on everyone held their breath, he stood his ground. Two out of three isn't bad. In the same issue, in that piece on doggy bags in France, there was a gratuitous use of the F word by a Frenchman. I wonder, when the mail comes in, which will have offended the readers more? <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.